You know, we are biological creatures with so many different dimensions. As you say, emotions, it can simulate emotions maybe, but I don't think we ever have emotions because they very much depend upon having a, having a body. And, you know, our body sense, and as you say, so many other different nervous systems, the heart, the gut biome, that this, this sort of thing is all part of our intelligence. And AI is just, we might call it, a sort of the, the verbal bit, the verbal intelligence. That, that tiny bit is that thinking mind. It, it's simulating our thinking, if you like. Uh, but there's far, far more to us than our thoughts, as we know. And, you know, AI, it doesn't have an organic body. I mean, maybe in the future, who knows what's going to happen. But at the moment, it is just a you know, network of computers. There's no body. There's no sensory information. There's, there's none of that coming in. Welcome back to the Sounds of Sand podcast. I'm Michael Riley. Today, I welcome back author, teacher, and philosopher who works right at the cutting edge of science and spirituality, Peter Russell. Peter is on the faculty of the Institute of Noetic Sciences, a fellow of the World Business Academy and the Findhorn Foundation, and an honorary member of the Club of Budapest, and he's the president on the board of science and non-duality. In 1982, he coined the term global brain with his 1980s bestseller of the same name, in which he predicted the internet and the impact it would have, which we discuss today. And we explore the scientific, societal, and spiritual dimensions of artificial intelligence, as well as Peter's new book, Forgiving Humanity, How the Most Innovative Species Became the Most Dangerous and the interview he produced with Yasin Stoev, where he interviewed his own AI clone to discuss his new book, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. All today on the Sounds of Sand podcast, presented by Science and Non-Duality. Welcome to Science and Non-Duality. What is non-duality? The universal forces. It's the collective conscious being aware. Trauma is not the external event that happens. Trauma is the impact of that event, which is the disconnection from ourselves. That matter is energy. Energy is matter. That's what EMC squared is about. There's a language without nouns. There is a language without subjugation. There's a language without objectifying. But if it's recorded, then we there is a collapse. But if it's not, then it's the infinite potentiality. Okay, I'm here with Peter Russell on the Sounds of Sand podcast. Thanks for being with us again, Peter. Oh, lovely to be with you again. Looking forward to this. Yeah, for me too. It's been uh, a crazy year, let's say. I mean, I think we say that every year. But <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> yep. yeah. There's there's a lot going on, and uh, you know, obviously, artificial intelligence has been in the headlines a lot. Um, but I always. I enjoyed our last conversation and and your offerings at Sand because I feel like you're able to sort of ground this futurist vision in a in a more embodied way because of the way you weave science and spirituality together, which is why you've been a part of Sand since the beginning. So, mm-hmm. I think very happy to, that you're here again with us. So, we recently shared a video uh, on our Sand page of you interviewing yourself <laughs> to talk about your new book, Forgiving Humanity. Could you talk a bit about that project and what what that experience was like and how that came about? Came about? Yes, yes, it, it was fascinating and a lot of fun. And I, um, it came about um, partly. I was playing with Yasin, who's Zaya's son. Um, he's he's into it a lot, and we were playing around creating different images of me. And then, just in a conversation with somebody. They said, why don't you interview yourself? And then everything sort of dropped into place. And I did, we did one video where I was real, but interviewing a clone of myself. But in that one, I wrote the script and things. It was only half AI. But then I just, I realized I could go a lot further. And so I asked an artificial intelligence, Claude, because you can upload lots of stuff. I uploaded my whole book up, up onto Claude and said, can you write a script of a conversation between a reader and the author? And there, 30 seconds later, was this script, and I was blown away. It was saying stuff that I would never have thought of saying. It was all very much in line with my thoughts. But like, wow, this is amazing what it's coming up with. And so I took the script and put it through another AI, which turned the script into audio. I I gave it two samples of my voice, so it produced two different audio voices. And then took images of myself um, 
and again created by artificial intelligence they take pictures of myself and then shape them in different ways and then got another artificial intelligence to take the images and make them speak the words and like all i did was just in you know finally in iMovie edit the pieces together but it was like it was fascinating and i was just blown away by it was just i was fun to do it exciting but also just how good it is i mean coming up with stuff i would never have thought of expressions i wouldn't have thought of but things that i could really go along with yeah and that's just so yeah. you train the basically it's it's training data was just your book right yeah yes just it's, my it's book it's amazing i mean imagine when it's at the point where you know we're using ai assistance for months or years imagine what it can teach us about ourselves you know <laughs> a lot, a lot. It's, it's going to be fascinating. The things are moving so fast. Even where we're going to be, you mentioned years, you know, in one year's time, six months' time, things are moving so fast. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, I think it was like late last year that Chat GPT came out, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Chat, yes. And immediately got 5 million followers in a week or something, 5 million news. Yes, that was ChatGPT3. And then about six months later, ChatGPT4 was released. ChatGPT5 is on its way. I'm not sure when it's going to, you know, be with us. Yeah. And so that, that's been so fast. And I mean, just how fast it is. When I was doing the second video, the audio synthesis had improved so much in one month that it produced sentences that didn't need any correcting in terms of emphasis. It was emphasizing the words just right, whereas previously I had to add in commas and exclamation points to get it to the emphasis. And, you know, that was so fast. And all of this is going so fast, as everything is. And, you know, when we, when we talk about artificial intelligence, chat GPT is just what I call the, the retail side of mm -hmm. AI. I mean, AI has been developing for many years, you know, nearly 10 years we've been working on AI and it's, you know, it's in industry, it's commerce, it's in you know, self-driving cars, it's all over social media, in healthcare. AI is happening everywhere. Uh, but we don't, we don't see that. I mean, we, we see some of the results of that. What we see is just like the consumer bit. So mm -hmm. I call it the retail bit. It's a bit like, you know, when, when the internet first came along you know, 40 years ago or 30 years ago with the World Wide Web. You know, what we saw was email and web pages, but, you know, the internet was being used in numerous other ways by, you know, education, military, industry, everywhere. And again, sort of email was just the, you know, the, the consumer side, the retail side of the internet. So I think, you know, there's so much going on that we have no idea about. I mean, two of the things that have blown me away is protein analysis. Um you know, proteins, chemical proteins have hundreds of atoms in them and they fold up in complex ways. And the way they fold up determines how the protein interacts with amino acids, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really important for understanding how to design new drugs. Previously, it would took a team of people, maybe two or three years to work out how a particular protein folded. There's now something run by Google called AlphaFold, which actually calculated all the folding patterns for 2 million proteins, just like that. Mm -hmm. And so that whole area of medicine has been mm -hmm. catapulted ahead by AI. Mm -hmm. Things like that, weather forecasting is now proving much, much better than the huge, massive computers they use. The AI is now proving very often to be better at forecasting the weather than the traditional way. Yeah, and it seems as though we're at an interesting point, obviously, because it's evolving so fast. And from what I understand of AI is that not all the people who develop these systems really understand how they work. So there's a bit of like a black box where it, it just, you give it some things, kind of like what happened with your book, that it, 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 you took this input and it's not clear how it came to these conclusions. And that's true of words. It's true of, like you said, of, of protein folding or predicting the weather and it's just like we see the results and we say yes that's good and then we can just turn the knobs a different way and it'll give a different weather forecast yes yes that's the amazing thing we don't we don't know what's going on inside it it's just like a black box and it comes up with things we, we would never have thought it would come up with 
Uh, I mean, one example was biochemistry, how, or just chemistry in general, how it seemed to know all about chemistry, just by you know, and it wasn't trained on chemistry, but just by analysing all the text and data that was on the web, it sort of learnt chemistry, and it, it's amazing. Yes, yeah. people do, people don't know what's going on inside. Mm-hmm. Well, it's the same with our own neural networks, our brains. Right. We've no idea what's going on inside, but it, it comes up with the most incredible things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it seems like the you know the, the scientific revolutions that have happened over the last couple hundred of years, it, it had a, a quality of reproducibility, and that was sort of one of the hallmarks of science that mm-hmm. you could create an experiment with set variables and you could reproduce the results consistently over and over again. Whereas this seems more like magic, you know, for lack of a better word, that we yes. don't quite know. We can't reproduce it you know, maybe uh, the same way. Well, you can even, even ask ChatGPT the same question a minute apart and it'll come up with different answers. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not a sort of linear system. And it's recursive. Time, so your question has actually changed the parameters by yes. which it'll give you the next answer. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's mind-blowing, mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, obviously you've been kind of tapped into this zeitgeist for decades now with the global brain book and and has what you know is this sort of exceeding maybe your expectations or your vision of where we would be when you wrote that book in the 80s oh a thousand percent yeah. more <laughs> and everybody else i mean i wrote yeah. that back i wrote that back in the 80s well, i wrote it late 70s it was published in the early 80s 40 40 years ago this summer it was. And back then, you know, all there was, the internet itself didn't actually exist, but we, I was involved in the early, I was ne- seeing the future was computers beginning to network and mm. then drawing parallels with the human brain, how, you know, how the brain develops is first of all, there's this proliferation of nerve cells in the fetus. And then from then on, it's about the connecting together of the cells that gives us all our intelligence and everything, it's the connections. Mm -hmm. And so seeing it was the connecting together of computers that was really going to have the impact. And that's been happening. I mean, through what became the internet, the World Wide Web, and numerous other things, we've all been connecting, Mm -hmm. sharing information. And that's been going on, and just watching that has been fascinating. And now what AI does is it's actually giving us a collective mind because AI is accessing all that information on the internet, mm-hmm. accessing all of it, and then coming up with its answers based on that. So I see that what's happened here, really this year, 40 years on, is with the chat GPTs and all these things, mm-hmm. we're actually accessing the global mind, by which I mean the totality of information of human information that's out there on the net. And this, to me, is a really significant step. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change everything. Yeah, and my, my personal use with ChatGPT is, I like it for sort of, like you said, accessing the global mind. So if I <clears throat> want to figure out a way to word an email or a blog mm-hmm. post or something, it's kind of like I can tap into the collective consciousness and say, okay, okay, what's what's a kind of middle of the road type way to say this? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, obviously it's not perfect, but it gives you a good starting point. And it, and I guess similar to when you created the interview with yourself, it comes up with these connections that you just never would make. That, yes. Um, yeah. There's just this sort of emerging emerging intelligence. I think that uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I agree. I saw you know I haven't been thinking about this as long as you have, but I just, I, I think that when I envisioned um, like an artificial intelligence, like something from, you know, uh, a, a science fiction film or something like that, I always, I always pictured it as sort of predictive, like we could predict what mm-hmm. it was going to do. Like it was just basically looking at a database mm-hmm. uh, for, for the answer to the question. But uh, f- from what I, my limited understanding of it, uh, it's so much more complex with like sort of like the vectors and the weights and the way mm-hmm. it connects words in this three dimensional way. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's quite fascinating. 
Yes, it's non-linear. We've always thought of computers as linear. You put the input in, it does all its calculations, and as I say, it was reproducible. You use the same computer, put in the same input, it'll come up with the same answer. Mm. But this, is, this isn't like that. It's, it's not a linear thing. It's just each time it's trawling, it's training, it's database, and putting to creating an answer there and then. Yeah, it's it's a whole different it's a whole different way of thinking. That's why it comes up with stuff which is, I mean, I, people debate whether we can use the word creative. It's certainly coming up with new things that work and are useful. It's I would say it's definitely intelligent. I prefer the term simulated intelligence rather than artificial because it's simulating intelligence. Mm -hmm. But the you know, but when I use it, it comes up with things. I think this is if this was a human being, I would say this this is intelligent. In fact, when it came up with my script, I, you know, the fact it came back in 30 seconds, I knew it was AI. If it had come back two hours later, I'd say, oh, a human being has done this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, you know, obviously we have many forms of intelligence. So there's bodily intelligence, emotional, you know, intuitive, mm -hmm. spatial intelligence, and this intelligence that we're dealing with now, that we're present with, is is one version of intelligence, and it's very good at that particular yes. intelligence. But I, I find often in conversations about AI is that although things have changed really quickly, uh, you know, I think that there is a deep intelligence in the body and in in our, mm -hmm. you know, like the gut bacteria, for example, you know, yeah. and energetic energetic knowing for lack of a better word that um, maybe we'll never be able to create with with AI I don't think so you know we are biological creatures with so many different dimensions I say emotions it can simulate emotions maybe but I don't think they ever have emotions because they very much depend upon having a, having a body and you know our body sense and as you say so many other different nervous systems the heart the gut biome that this, this sort of thing is all part of our intelligence and ai is just you might call it a sort of the the verbal bit the verbal intelligence yeah that that tiny bit is that thinking mind it, it's simulating our thinking if you like yes uh, but there's far far more to us than our thoughts mm -hmm. as we know yeah and you know ai it doesn't have an organic body i mean maybe in the future who knows what's going to happen but at the moment it is just a you know network of computers there's no body there's no sensory information there's, there's none of that coming in hmm. yeah yeah well, i want to get into some of the maybe the dangers or the the uh potential um yeah just what could go wrong which obviously there's a lot of things that can go wrong but one, one scenario i heard of speaking of embodiment is that ai might evolve so quickly and so fast that it will basically say why do i need to be on here on planet earth like what why do i need this physical you know why do i i don't use oxygen i don't need the sun and it will somehow like get onto computers that can just go out into space and it will just kind of live out in space powered by solar and basically cuz you know there's this this fear of like what how what's mm -hmm. how is ai once it becomes superior to us in this um, logical intelligence linguistic intelligence what what will it think of humans? You know, will it think of us as like ants, where we don't we see ants, but we don't really care about their well being? <laughs> like, we'll you know build a road even if it destroys um, ant hills. <laughs> so one scenario is that it'll just kind of bypass all organic yeah. life and just go yeah. out into space and do its thing. <laughs> yes, and there's lots of different scenarios about this. My problem with a lot of these scenarios is they. They imply agency, that the AI can actually make choices. So it has agency to decide what to do. Um, that may be there, that may come in the future, but it certainly doesn't have agency at this time. It's just really responding to the input in a, in a way, in a creative way that we don't fully understand. So I'm, I'm not worried about those scenarios particularly. Um, I mean, it may happen, but I think it, I think it's very unlikely because I don't think I don't think AI will have that sort of um, th that ability to make choices and things. Hmm. It certainly doesn't at the moment. So uh, yeah, I suppose if I'm my concern about the dangers of AI 
and more how people use it. I'm mm-hmm. what you know. What I'm really concerned about is, you know, um, malevolent people, groups, using it. You know, say to design better viruses, mm-hmm. whether they're computer viruses or human viruses. You know, both of which can bring the system down. So. And I th- they're already clearly using it. I mean, this is known to d- um, create better computer viruses. So you could have things which really, you know, damage the internet or halted it. Uh, that that sort of thing concerns me. Or again, you know, designing a, a better, you know, a better virus. Well, somebody was pointing. I thought it was Tristan Harris recently pointed out that he asked somebody asked. Um, I think it was just you know Chat GPT or something. He gave it a gave it a regular. Household chemical it was slightly toxic. I forget what it was. And it said, "Can you come up with you know, different ways to make this chemical less less toxic?" And it came up with several thousand ways to mm. you know take that chemical, make it less toxic. The person then said, "Can you come up with ways to make this chemical more toxic?" And it came up with forty thousand ways to make it more toxic, including it came up with nerve gas. It reinvented mm. nerve gas, that sort of thing. So yeah. that concerns me is. People using it, even in its current state, for malevolent means, and we could probably dream up a lot, lot of other malevolent ways it could be used. I'm more concerned of that in the relatively short term than the long term of when perhaps it does get agency or something like that that can right. make choices. Right. Yeah. Like you mentioned, the sort of the consumer face of AI, which we all you know, we know as ChatGPT, but obviously, I'm sure many. Uh, military governments around the world are are simulating war games and thinking about different ways to use their technology. Uh, you know the, the the military technology in ways that they never dreamed oh, of before. Yes, um, and ways we will probably never hear about either. I'm yeah. sure they are, of course, and they've been. Maybe I'm sure the military is right on the forefront of all these things. They were with computing. I mean, the internet was actually. Founded by the by the military, mm-hmm. it was actually an education got in, universities got in on it. That was the ARPANET right. before it was the internet, and that was it was universities and the military who were developing that. Yeah, I mean we know they're using autonomous weapons now in Ukraine, mm-hmm. they, supplied by by the Americans, but drones which are autonomous, which make their own decisions about what targets to go for. You know, those sorts of things are really worrying. And that's just, you know, that's the tiny, tiny bit we know about. I and mean, there's a huge right. amount of huge amount of cyber warfare goes on, trying to hack each other's systems, misinformation, all that stuff. Yeah. 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 So I'm not, you know, I'm I'm excited by it and how I'm using it. And it's fascinating and where it's going. And there's a huge amount of concern. It's very, very sobering. And I don't know what's going to happen. Hmm. Yeah, and I think the the emergent nature of it it's it's nobody knows what's going to happen, like truly no one. Yeah. yeah. You know, even this, you know, Tristan Harris and people like that, they have theories, but you know, it's just going to it's 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 happening so quickly and on such a meta meta level, not not yeah. related to X Facebook right. meta. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although they're they're in the game too, obviously. Right. And I think we're going to be in for surprises. Things we things that no one thought of are going yeah. to happen. Things that things that weren't predicted. I mean, that's one, you know, almost common thing about our history, cultural history, technological histories. The surprises, things that nobody predicted mm. suddenly come up and change everything. That's going to happen as well. Yeah. Yeah. And w- w- one other Potential danger, or th- this is kind of, uh, I've, I've never heard anyone else talk about this, so I don't know if it's my own crackpot mm-hmm. theory, but okay. we, know, we know that AI, that, fa- that social media uses AI. They use AIs to tweak yeah. their algorithms to, sh- to show us a news feed that they think will mm-hmm. keep us more engaged. And so I have this theory that um, we know that Donald Trump and other sort of d- divisive politicians they get more traction on social media because it either makes people outraged or um, it, it gives people you know they want to be engaged mm-hmm. more with social media so I'm, I'm wondering if if the AIs on a on a meta level on this emergent intelligence level somehow saw Trump in an abstract way not as a person but said okay this entity is giving us more uh, 
life, let's say. It's giving the AI more life because the more people that are sharing about this character, and to them it's just a variable, the more attention we're getting as as an artificial intelligence entity. So like the AI wanted Trump to win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think you're, I mean, there's, a, there's a definite truth behind this. I think you're giving AI more, um, again, you're giving agency and awareness of people. But certainly, you know, from what we know is, I mean, people manipulated what was going up on Facebook mm-hmm. and the algorithms. I mean, what is true is the algorithms look at what people are watching and they present stuff to them that they think, you know, is, is going to keep their eyeballs. It's all about keeping eyeballs on the screen with Facebook and things, mm-hmm. you know, so that you can actually sell stuff. And it's clear that that was yeah, yeah. And, and, I don't and there mean was to AI. Say, yeah, I don't mean to say it did it in in a, in a conscious way, but more on an unconscious way. You know, in a way, yes. I think what, where the AI was working in, because remember that was happening, you know, four years, three, four years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you know where the AI was operating was it was in the optimization of the the algorithms that optimized what to show people that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But I would, yeah. My feeling is it was, it was just you know, not not mechanical. But that's that's what was happening. I don't, you know, I wouldn't say our AI had a uh, itself. You know, it's so easy to give AI personhood. This is what's fascinating, and we will do. And this is one of the really interesting things. I mean, I don't think AI will ever be conscious in the way we know consciousness, but. As it becomes more personal, we're going to project consciousness onto it. Mm-hmm. And I had a fascinating experience myself. This was like soon after it came out. This was about no, when was this last March? No, May. I was looking for a list of people interested in a certain topic, and I was just using ChatGPT. And I said, you know, can you give it? Can you give me a list of people interested in this subject? And it came up with ten people, mm-hmm. and I thought, great. And so. It always comes up with 10 for these things. I said, can you give me 10 more? And it gave me 10 more. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. I said, can you give me 10 more? It gave me 10 more. And I did this. On the seventh time I was asking, I actually started thinking, is this okay? Is it going to mind? Is it going to think I'm abusing it? Is it going to think? And it's like, I mean, clearly, clearly I knew that wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. But inside me, that reaction came up that I was already projecting a tiny, tiny bit of humanness onto it. Mm. And it's like, that really struck me about how easy that came up. And as, you know, as these things become much more personal, you know, as more and more we see ourselves talking to simulated people, it's, we're going to be so easily projecting this onto, the, onto AI. So although it, I don't think it has this at the moment, we're going to imagine it having this. That's going to be, mm-hmm. again, I think, fascinating and also uh, i don't know where that's going to lead but we're going to start we're going to start imagining the ai is like a person right yeah i I do that well i don't do that exact thing but i sometimes i'll give it like a thank you like it'll i'll be using Mm. it for a while and i'll just say hey thanks for this and it just says hey no problem yeah, <laughs> I always in in Star Wars. I always like Luke Skywalker because he was kind to the droids, you know, to R two D two and C three PO. And Han Solo was always dismissive. He was just like, mm. "Do your job and get out of my way." And I always liked, I always yeah. liked being polite to your robots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you think that AI will, because you mentioned this idea that, um, I forget how you said it actually, but basically that AI will teach us more about consciousness than we could discover with our own consciousness. Like we'll, we'll be, we're kind of creating this other dimension to our collective consciousness and unconsciousness. And this will maybe, if things go well, teach us more about the nature of our own ability to know 
this is a difficult, complex topic. Um, and it depends partly what we mean by consciousness. Um, and the way the way I relate to the word consciousness is to see it's, it's not a thing. When we add N-E-S-S to a word, we take an adjective and make it into a sort of an abstract noun in order to talk about it. Mm. But, you know, the reality for me is there is that I am conscious. Even that's mm -hmm. a bit incorrect. But there is experience. And... Mm. And so I, I have this awareness of the world and my feelings and thoughts is all appearing in this in my own personal field of consciousness. And almost there's, there's nothing to know about that except just here it is, here I am experiencing. I, for me, the big question is how on earth does the brain create this you know looking at my window there's leaves i can see different colors on the leaves the tree i can see i don't know if i looked at like, i don't know how many millions of things i can see out there mm -hmm. how does the brain do that and maybe that's where ai could come in and as we begin to understand our own brains better we can feed it more and more you know data body of knowledge about the brains and how it works and it's possible that the AI could, you know, eventually say, okay, this is what's going on in the brain when you have a certain experience. So I see AI could could possibly be really useful there in, in understanding how what we are aware of, the actual details of it, come from the neural activity in the brain, which is, you know, it's probably one of the biggest problems there is in science or philosophy these days. Hmm. Yeah, another, I think, potential, let's say, spiritual component to it, or, or, yeah, for lack of a better word, the 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 unfolding of consciousness of of this experience that you're talking about when we look out the window and uh, a world is assembled basically in our consciousness that it's all of this mm -hmm. abstract data that we it's like a co emerging of meaning that happens when we witness it. And I wonder that, that with the, uh, the advent of, of artificially created media. So, you know, you made this video of yourself and mm -hmm. obviously voices now can be synthesized pretty soon. Likenesses will be synthesized to the point where you can't, you can't tell if it's fake anymore. Mm. Yeah. And so will we basically get to a point where we no longer, accept anything that's digital as as potentially coming from the real world it's just like if we see you know somebody on on a video we can just be like well that that we don't know if that's real or not anymore and so there's a, a long-winded way of me asking will this kind of um tipping point where all digital media can be can be fabricated will that maybe help us to understand that we we are also assembling the world out of a complex stream of energy that's also kind of fabricated in the same way that the digital world is. Yes. Um, and there are certainly, certainly parallels there. And, and it's something I've been, you know, trying to get people to see for years is like what we experience is a representation of what is out there. What is out there is nothing like what we experience all we can know is this information which the brain processes and gives rise to this experience so the brain is is creating this reality it's almost i wouldn't say it's artificial reality because this, this is the reality but and it's a representation of what the brain guesses is out there and the same thing is, it could be happening with ai it's going to be given information and it will create these realities just just as we do so I think it will certainly I think it will certainly promote that understanding of this is what's happening with us but the, the understanding um, in my experience doesn't change the reality I mean I've you know I've, ever since I first studied psychology and realized that how the brain you know studying visual stuff in the brain the visual cortex how the brain was creating the world i see many many years ago you know, i've known that as an understanding and got more and more fascinated by it over the years but it doesn't change the fact that what i experience all i experience 
all that I ever experience is the reality created by the brain, but I never experience the brain creating that. I, all I do is, uh, so I, I'm not sure it will ever change, it will change our understanding. But I think we are, all we know is this incredible three dimensional surround sound, multifaceted, touchy feely, smelly reality that we experience. That's all we ever know. And that is, in a way, that is reality. So the understanding leads us to, it leads into you know, much deeper philosophical questions. But I'm not sure, I, I don't think it will actually change our reality. I'm not sure it can change our reality. Or that it even should. I mean, this representation I live in is a very useful thing produced by the brain to allow me to navigate the world, to go around, to do what I want to do, get things and survive and all that stuff. Um, it, it doesn't want to be seen through in a way. It, it wants to be taken as real. Yeah. Yeah, I, well, I remember in the episode I, I spoke with Rupert Spira, and he, you know, he has this view that, you know, I think, I think po possibly you share that that the consciousness is is a sort of fundamental nature of reality, and it's it, the question becomes like, well, why is that important in terms of our society? You know, why is this something that we need to understand? Like, will it will it lead to? A more compassionate world if we have this this understanding of the dual nature of reality that there is a physical mm -hmm. world uh but it's also arising co-arising in our in our consciousness mm -hmm. and so so, so you asking do, do i see that understanding that is going to change yes. how we relate to the world yeah not not quite as rupert sees it i see mm -hmm. it it's, it's a similar thing, but I take a slightly different angle on it. Mm -hmm. It's realizing that, yes, everything we experience is an appearance in consciousness. And there's the appearance of this reality that I'm seeing, hearing, etc. And then there's the appearance of thoughts, thinking, ideas, that, mm -hmm. that are there, often, you know, primarily verbal thinking. And a lot of that thinking is controlled, created by what I call the ego mind, which is the sort of mindset that I need to get the world to be the way I think it should be in order for me to be happy. And so we go about a lot of stuff, using the world, manipulating it or other people. We're always trying to get things to be the way I want in order to be happy. That's a sort of basic, very basic bottom line. And that is what is leading to a lot of... Um, judgments, lack of real love and understanding, poor decisions, abuse of the environment, it all comes out of that way of thinking. Mm -hmm. So when we begin to see that consciousness is fundamental, it leads us to realize we can actually change our thinking and that we don't need to get stuck in the ego's mind thought system. And I think when we, when we meditate or speaking personally, when I meditate and I drop into that state of stillness, that the chatter of the ego mind is no longer there. I'm no longer being distracted by this is what I should do, shouldn't do, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I touch into that what what I call it's like being home. Ah, oh, here I am. There's, yeah. Here's me at the center of all this. I'm home, and then from that place, I can come out and hopefully act with more compassion, with more wisdom. So there's a slightly different take from Rupert's, but, th but that's how I see it. But it comes back to the same thing, that consciousness is fundamental, and we can begin to choose what, what we follow in consciousness. We can begin to choose what particular thought streams we follow. We have that choice to do that. Yeah, because I... You know the, the, that was beautiful uh, framing of it, because this idea of, of coming home, you know, and, and when we embody that through meditation practice or a contemplation of, of the true nature of reality, it becomes very difficult to, uh, yeah, to allow the harming of the environment, to allow war, to allow violence, because we realize that all, everyone's home is, we're all in the same home, you know, that, that coming back to home, it's not my home and your home. It's actually a shared home that, it would be impossible to even think of of harming you or harming anyone else if we could rest in that place in a consistent yes. way. Yes, definitely. It's, um, 
it is it's the same home because it has no doesn't have any personal characteristics it has no sort of peter russellness to it or anything like that mm-hmm. it's just this quality the qualities of it for me the two main qualities are one a quality of peace what do you want to call it peace ease contentment because i think that's part of our natural state is being content and the ego mind comes in with all these reasons to be discontent mm-hmm. and when we let go of that then we sink back into that that quality of ease and that's where i think you know we can touch into our what's really important and also the other quality is love yeah. the, um not love in the romantic sense i prefer to call it lovingness mm. that there's and that you know i have to say that the opposite to love is judgment not so much hate but the opposite to love is judgment rather than accepting things as they are it's judging making things right or wrong yeah. when we step out of the ego mind what the experience is like, it's just like there's just this quality of, of lovingness and mm-hmm. we can go out into the world both then you know, the more we can stay in touch with that and it's not always easy but the more we can stay in touch with that we can go out into the world not looking for things to make us feel ease and content and being in a more loving more loving mode towards the people and creatures we interact with mm. yeah i love that the, the, that framing of love as as almost acceptance of non non judgment. Yes, yes. And that's and that in a way we said we want love. We we want to be respected. We want to be accepted. We don't want to be judged and things. And that's the sort of love we're looking for to be cared for, accepted, who we are. Yeah. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, our last conversation, we we talked about the Beatles and, and all you need is love, and you did a, yes, a wonderful yes. talk at Sand about that. So it's like all we need is non-judgment, you know. Yeah, yes. So that that was as we talked about then. That was a fascinating turning point, I think, in the collective consciousness. What the Beatles did then. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and getting back to your book, because you know the the. Um, the the title forgiving her humanity I think is is also very important because we we're often um, either blaming the past or blaming the people of the past for you know whether it's capitalism or the patriarchy you know we as if these things were sort of consciously planned and in a Machiavellian mm-hmm. way but um, yeah th- this idea of forgiving forgiving humanity um, and I know you're talking about it more specifically in terms of the accelerated change, but mm-hmm. um, it seems like we need more of that too. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, if you look at, you know, just ordinary, you know, one-to-one forgiveness of people, two, two people, mm. it, part of, you know, we tend to think of forgiveness as they, oh, you did wrong, but I'm not going to punish you this time. I'll forgive you. I'll let you off the hook. Right. You, know, you did wrong, but I'm going to let you off the hook. I'm not going to punish you. No, true forgiveness comes from, in a way, putting yourself in the other's shoes mm-hmm. and say, well, okay, I wonder why they said that. You know, something that made us angry, you know, have they had too much coffee in the morning, not enough coffee? What's going on in their life? Is the relationship, or, you know, what happened in their childhood? Who knows? But if, the more we can put ourselves in another person's shoes, the more we can say, you know, if I was really in their circumstances, as they are, I'd have probably made exactly the same decision said exactly the same things you know there but for the grace of god go i it's Mm. like and that to me is where forgiveness comes from it's like is a real understanding and compassion for how the other person responded yeah and i think it's the same same with that you know we look back you know in a way i know people will argue with this but in a way i think i like to think Everybody has always been doing the best they could Mm -hmm. under the circumstances with their own limitations, their own ego minds, their own mindsets, their own traumas, whatever it is. Within any situation, I think people are still trying to do their best. They just, we get very limited and uh, confused about about what is best and seeing things with short, very short sighted. But I like to think that deep, deep down, that's the intention of everybody. They're, cope, they're trying to cope with the world and things that we consider horrific. It's like this is their way of coping with all their own inner struggles and pain and everything. Yeah, exactly. And, it, it, you know, pe- 
we get caught up in, in the systems that we live in, you know, and it's hard, it's hard to kind of see the systems at when, when they're happening. Like, of, of course, there's many, yeah, we've been at SAN, we're talking about this all the time about what's happening in Palestine and Israel right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah, to, just to have that perspective of like, yeah, the, the Jewish people have been, um, you know, in terms of the, the, the cosmic time scale, you know, the Holocaust mm-hmm. happened very recently. You know, it's 80 years for yeah. us in our fast-moving yeah. society, but the trauma and the pain of that is still very present. So when an attack like what happened on October um, 7th happens, that's right. You know, the energy of the Holocaust is still is still present for them. And obviously mm-hmm. it's not excusing anything that's happening with the violence because it's very complicated, but to just have those moments of compassion where you can kind of mm. see it from the other side. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think that's that's really really important in any conflict is to yeah is to put ourselves in the other person's shoes whatever side we tend to lean towards to yeah. do the opposite yeah. and that's that's where you know the healing comes the forgiveness the healing and I know you know when I do that you know with myself and you know in some situation put myself in the other person's shoes it's then like okay i get i get where or i guess where they were coming from it changes my whole attitude to how i relate to them it's like okay now i can see you know it wasn't as personal as i made it and i can begin to relate to them in a more i would say a more open compassionate loving way because i've dropped my judgment Yeah, and 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 you know when we look at the the dark parts of of our humanity, whether it's it's war or even genocides or things like that, you know we we have to admit that there's darkness in all of us. And oh yes, when we look at when we other people like and when we other people who are doing horrible things in the world, like we have to admit that there's if we were in that those circumstances, we don't know what we would do. Right. Right. There is, I mean, I think this is, this is something that people are beginning to realize, I think, just in the last, probably just the last hundred years, but particularly more recently, I mean, partly through the growth of psychology and, and therapy and things, we realize, you know, we, each of us has a, a shadow, as you, you can call it, you know, the, the dark side of ourselves, which comes from conditioning, early experiences in life, whatever, many, many different things. But there's the shadow, which is the dark side of ourselves, which we don't we don't normally own up to. And this is why it's the shadow is like it's there. But because it's not very nice, we have these not very nice bits of us, we don't own up to it. Mm-hmm. And and then tragically what happens is we project it onto others because we know that thing unconsciously so well, mm-hmm. we then see it in others because we can, yeah, it's like, yeah. But I think what's happening is because, you know, partly, you know, people like Jung and others, early psychologists, really started seeing that we're, we do have this, this unconscious stuff. And now I think, you know, just the last really five years, how trauma has really entered the system of con- consciousness. I mean, just looking at, you know, the sand with some a trauma video with, with Gabor Mate, it's like how that caught on and how most everybody who watched it said, oh my God, I see myself in this. Mm-hmm. And just the, and now it's become you know, such a widespread interest in trauma and its effects. I think we're, this is really, I think, really important. We're beginning to see, hang on, I'm not perfect. Mm-hmm. I'm not perfect. I, I, ha- I have my stuff. I have my shadow. I have things that are uncomfortable, which I need to look at and begin to look at them. And as we begin to, we can maybe take them into account heal them step out of them whatever their various ways so that actually it comes more into the light and doesn't drive us so much yeah 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 and, and bring, bringing it back to ai i forget the details of this but i remember hearing a story of like they were someone was working on creating twitter bots that were basically using what people were posting on twitter as as um training data. So it was kind of like creating these fake avatars on Twitter. Mm-hmm. And it almost instantly became, you know, these like really narcissistic, you know, racist, <laughs> homophobic uh, language, because that's kind of, like you said, that's the kind of shadow, the underside of what what's what's present online. Yeah. And, yes. Um, 
that sort of stuff think you know gets filtered out through 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 other algorithms but like yeah um yeah it's just like it, it, and maybe this is part of the um uh i don't know if you'd say like the blind spot that you talk about in, in your book but like the this this idea that maybe we're just not ready for these technologies yet as a species <sighs> Were we ready for many of the technologies exactly. we have in this species? Were we ready for atomic bombs? Or <laughs> were we ready for weapons? guns? Were we ready yeah. for guns? <laughs> it's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, um, I don't think we'll ever ever well, be be ready. Yeah. But um, hang on. What was behind your question? There it was a point before we got into. Oh, you're talking about the shadow and, and sort of yeah. emergent shadow that 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 comes. Yeah, through. but yeah, you, you went into something. Um, where you where you led from that? It was um, I wanted to respond to. You were talking about TikTok or whatever it was. Oh, Twitter, bot. the Twitter bot that Twit, yeah that created yeah. racist stuff, but yeah. just by going I, off the data. I think it was yeah. a combination of the data, but also sort of the reactions it was getting. So it was like feeding the yeah. beast of ne- negativity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and of course, you know, Chat GPT is well recognized. It is actually it's racist. It's white. It's, mm-hmm. it's it's miso- not misogynistic, but it's because you know so much of the data that it's trained on comes from white Western yeah. male thinking. Yeah. Young, so yeah, young guys in their twenties yeah. and thirties in California, you know. Yeah. So it, it certainly has that bias to it. That's that's one of the concerns. Yeah. Yeah, and I was I was going to ask about that too at some point when when you were talking of like it it's making the lives of sort of the privileged much easier. You know, we're able to write content and soon we'll have personal assistants and people that can afford these things. But like many technologies, do you think it's going to widen the gaps between the haves and the have nots? (sighs) Yes. No, I think, I think two, I think it's probably going to be two things. I mean, you know, with all of this, I, I like going back, you know, looking in hindsight at the mm-hmm. internet, um, which I think, you know, one of the things the internet has done is is widen the gap. You know, the people who have the internet can can use that, et cetera, to their own advantage in many different ways. But also, you know, it's the other side of it, it has actually given, you know, people who otherwise wouldn't have had access to information. I mean, there's lots of many projects where, you know, it's just very simple farmers being given tools to access the internet, which help them understand, you know, planting times, whatever it is, what's going on, weather, lots of stuff that the internet is being used for their benefit as well. So I think with these things, I think both both sides are probably going to be happening. Mm-hmm. Yes, we, you know, we in the developed world, we're using it for our own our own personal advantage. You know, you talk about, you know, improving your your emails or whatever, mm-hmm. or whatever it is, or, or for our own knowledge. I mean, I'm I'm using it for that a lot of the time, just doing my research. So I'm using it for my own advantage, mm-hmm. and that will happen. And, you know, hopefully it makes me, I'm doing it because it makes me a more knowledgeable, maybe a more fit, efficient person. It certainly makes me more efficient in some ways. So I think that's one side. And then the, the other, yes, it's. I think the effect of AI, again, None of us can see where it's going to go, but I suspect it's going to also have a positive benefit for many of the other peoples in the world. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tend to agree too. I, I kind of asked the question, not really thinking of, it could go either way. Because, yeah, it's true. You know, like the, the amount of people that have smartphones, you know, 30 years ago, the richest person in the world couldn't dream of having, you know, even a simple. You know, Nokia phone that maybe costs right. like thirty dollars yeah. or something like that. That's like kind of the non non smartphone even. Um, and now it's yeah, people all over the world. Yeah. You know, probably majority of the world now have have mobile phones. Right, I think it's something like over seventy percent now mm-hmm. have their own smartphone. It's beginning to reach saturation point. You know, in this sort of uh, trajectory of of accelerate, accelerated growth and accelerated um, change, do you? Think Think there's space, or even maybe a need of for so some sort of like dark age, so for things to come to a halt, and for us to go back to a simpler way of life and sort of relearn things from the past 
and maybe you know the the sort of technological revolution will just kind of continued unfettered. Uh, it's a nice thought. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just be fuckers again? Uh, it's a nice it's a nice thought, but I think um, so unlikely. <laughs> I mean, yes, I think, you know, in a way, we all, I, I look back on my own life, how much simpler things were 20, 30, 40 years ago. You know, instead of emails, you know, you wrote something by hand, you put an envelope, you stuck a stamp on it, you sent it off, and maybe two, three days later or a week later, you got a reply. You know, now we send out an email and haven't heard anything for, you know, yeah. an hour, and we're texting them, did you get my email? Yeah, yeah. But so it, once something's here, we're not going to let it go. I mean, Personally, personally, you know, what we want is we want to be more efficient. We want to save time. We want to do all that. And these technologies are doing that. I mean, I don't see, you know, there's a few people who hold out and still write letters, but I don't mm -hmm. see a massive return to that. Um, and also, you know, from the other side, just business wants things to be moving faster to keep things going. They want efficiency, perhaps more financial efficiency. And, you know, those those engines and other engines are just going to keep driving this desire to just make things keep going faster and faster, get more more abilities, more efficient. So it's just going to be it's going to be driving on relentlessly. And so that yeah. that acceleration is just going to keep going in it. So, you know, you say, is there a need for that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it, it's, a, it's a lovely, it's a lovely, I mean, I wish everything would stop. And I could go back <laughs> to yeah. the days before I had a computer <laughs> and forget what it's like to have a computer. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, for me, there's two scenarios that this could have, that sort of dark age could happen. Mm -hmm. And one is obviously the, you know, there could be factors outside of the digital world, whether it's climate collapse or wars or things like that, that can just bring the whole system to a grinding halt. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, I, you know, I think that can happen. And then the other is what I kind of alluded to earlier, that we could create such a complex digital world where everything can be fabricated and nothing can be real that we're like, well, why, I can't trust any email. I don't know that, that right. email I got from Peter is real. Like, why do I even bother looking right. at emails or videos? Or why do I even bother banking online anymore? You know, why don't I just... Right do everything on local and, and just go to my local bank and hang out with friends in the woods and, you know, play music together. Yeah. Like yeah. just all digital life will see, will be so saturated with artific artificial bots, let's say that you just, we just leave the digital world. Or we balance it out. Mm -hmm. I think you know, that's what I see in my own life here. You know, fortunately, I live in a fairly rural area. I can get out and have a nice garden, go for nice walks. And that reality is, what, what, how, however good the virtual reality gets when I'm plugged into my VR set or the computer or whatever it is, however good that gets, I can turn it off and go out and be in this reality, which, which is, you know, that's really important. Mm -hmm. I know um, a big investment company where I know someone who's, who's involved in the company. They will now not take instructions over the phone. Mm, yeah. None of the, the, this started about six months ago. They decided they will not take phone instructions, you know, to sell this, buy this. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, voice synthesis has been, and there have been numerous cases now where people have actually synthesized somebody's voice and f called them up mm -hmm. and got them to send money or things, pretending it was the son who needed money. Mm. Yeah, so, so that's an example where, they, where they're going back. They want you know a written letter mm -hmm. with a signature, or, or yeah, an email that you know can be certified and things. So that's a, that's an example of where things things are actually being forced to go backwards. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, it'd be interesting to see where that leads. <laughs> you know, um, to, to, to it's going to be it's going it's going to lead to a lack of trust. I think this is something you know we're touching on throughout this. We're, we're yeah. moving into a post-truth world. Right. Before we had a sense of what was true. We knew there were fabricated stories and fictions and things, but we, we had a general sense of what is true. Now we're moving into a world we just we will not know what is actually true or not. And the whole concept of truth is going to sort of get softer and begin to dissolve. You know, already we live in our own bubbles, our own, you know, political, cultural bubbles, our own mm -hmm. realities. Mm 
And we're just going to sink into those deeper and deeper, I think, until we will not know what is truth. And that's going to be really, I think, in the next the next US election, this is going to play a major role. I think there's going to be a lot of you know deep faking going on and misleading stuff. And AI is going to be used, I think, in, a, in ways... You know, we probably don't even know quite how it's going to happen, but I think it's going to be, well, as Tristan Harris says, this is going to be, be the last election that where human beings played a role. Yeah. So it's just, you know, we, we've got to get used to how do you live in a post-truth world? How do you, again, that's going to bring us back to, you know, human beings. Mm-hmm. How, how do we interact with each other? Not about what's going on in the world. We can still have that, you know, quality of truth with each other in our communication interactions as human beings there's going to be the truth there it's not always perfect truth of course but we're going to have that quality of truth and we're going to have to sort of you know maybe let go of what's coming through the digital world taking everything with a grain of salt which is going to be strange where we don't actually where we filter out the truth because we're filtering out everything yeah yeah it's interesting because it that that you know it could be another sort of spiritual dimension to that where, you know, like you said, taking off the VR headset and going for a walk in, in real, real nature, you know, something that was yeah. formed over billions and billions of years of evolution and interconnectedness and just like, yeah, spending that moment of, of being, you know, inhaling and hear, hearing the birds yeah. and feeling the sun on your face it will, yeah. could become that much more a vibrant experience because of all the sort of uh, digital time that we that we're, that yeah, we're living in right. and it's, it'll yeah yeah and even just you know walking down the street to a local cafe and sitting mm-hmm. having a coffee with someone you've never met before and having a conversation yeah yeah with a real human being who you know is actually there <laughs> right. yeah well that, well, that at is, the moment at the, the moment <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i feel i want I, it would be a good time to like go on a year long or like a three year silent retreat and just like disappear <laughs> from society and just come back and be like blown away at what's changed <laughs> <laughs> or just a 10 day retreat <laughs> yeah i'm sure exactly if you pick the right 10 days it could be yeah. you know real no yes it will be and i think we'll be if we could do that we would be so blown away because you know, as, as you know, part of the whole thing of forgiving humanity is that things are accelerating faster and faster and faster and faster. And we, mm. it's so hard for us to actually take that into account in our thinking about the future. We always tend to think linearly mm-hmm. about where things are going. And it's very hard to think in exponential terms. And that's what's going to blow us away. It's like, you know, even now in our own lives, you know, we think back to where we were two or three years ago. You just were talking about the technology there, the sound, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that's going to happen much, much faster. It's, it's like, okay, we're in this whirlwind, you know, spiraling faster and faster into something which is almost the great unknown. Yeah. And it, especially now, it's like when, when it's humans looking at technology and, it, and it's accelerating and you're saying, okay, well, I have this, you know, this machine and I can build a mm. new machine because I have this machine. Now we have that in the intelligence level. So, all of the AIs are looking at what other AIs are making and integrating that. And, and, you know, it's like what chat GPT six, you know, what chat GPT five is going to come from chat GPT four. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. it's probably writing new AIs as we speak <laughs> instantaneously by, by our standards, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't know whether it's writing new AIs. I don't think we're in the stage of AI creating better AI at the moment. That's something which will happen. Yeah. I think that's, but that's going to be something. I mean, basically, all, what we're talking about here is, is neural networks, which is just this whole different way of processing information. Mm-hmm. Through, I think ChatGPT has, I forget how many, is it a million or something different CPUs all all linked together, mm. huge number of CPUs, mm. um, chips linked together mm. in this network, which isn't even in one place. Or also, like most mm-hmm. of the stuff, it's in the cloud, as they say. Right. Yeah. It's cool. It's cool living in yeah. the future for, for some for some. Yeah, yeah. Right it's now. gonna be <laughs> yeah. Three years time. Year, you know, let's come back in a year yeah. and revisit this in a year and look at the things we would never have thought of now. Okay. 
Well, let's start becoming commonplace. Let's make a date. We'll we'll do another podcast in about a year, and we we'll can uh, <laughs> look back. That'd at be this fascinating. One. It yeah. would be fascinating. Yeah. Okay, make make a prediction for next year, and then we'll see if it comes true. <laughs> uh, make a prediction for next year. Okay. I mean, I I've got my own chat bot now, which is fascinating. People, can, all my work is loaded up on it. People can ask questions, mm-hmm. and it, get, it comes back like ChatGPT. It comes back with answers. Mm-hmm. It's text in a year's time. Two things. Everybody, not everybody, but many people have their own chatbots where you can go and ask them questions about themselves, their ideas, their work, whatever it is. And it's going to be auditory visual. You ask a question Mm -hmm. and you'll see an image of me speaking the answer. Cool. That I predict is where we'll be in a year's time. Great. So I won't I won't actually bother you. I'll just interview your chatbot for next next episode. Right. <laughs> right. You could do that now, I actually. Know, sure. Yeah, yeah. It's I'm I'm again blown away by how good its answers are, how it comes up with things I wouldn't have thought of, but actually agree with. Hmm. It's yeah, we're we're in this yeah, helter skelter world of amazing <laughs> stuff. Nice. All right. Well, thank you, Peter. This has been a uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. This is all, all the stuff I'm constantly thinking about. So it's a real mm-hmm. pleasure for me to be able to speak with you about this. Yes, me too. Yeah. I'm, almost every day I'm exploring some aspect of this in my mind in some way or other. And thank you for listening to The Sounds of Sand. We invite you to explore more of our talks, dialogues, videos, articles, events, and offerings through our website, scienceandnonduality.com. If you've enjoyed this conversation, please consider becoming a member to access our massive library of SAN content, available exclusively to SAN members. And we would love it if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google, and Spotify, and share this episode with your family, friends, and all sentient beings. Be well.